Stellar Life. Mission log number 261. It suddenly occurred to me, wow, my work doesn't apply just to love. It applies to any relationship. One of my best friends is very high on the serotonin scale, and I'm very high at dopamine. And I find when I'm around her that I'm almost acting, that I'm trying to fit into another person's worldview, but I'm not naturally who I am. So after a while, you begin to feel almost once you get to know all this stuff, you also begin to hunch, okay, this person is this way, so I should act this way around them. And that's key. I don't believe in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. I believe in the platinum rule, do unto others as they would have done unto them. Welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Get inspired and live out loud. From love, freedom, and success to having it all. Here's your host, coach, speaker, and shining star, Orion. Orion, you're looking good. Hi, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. This is your host, Orion. I am so excited to introduce you my next guest, Dr. Helen Fisher. She was chosen by Business Insider as one of the 15th most amazing women in science. Dr. Helen Fisher is a senior research fellow at at the Kinsey Institute and chief science advisor to Match.com. She uses brain scanning, fMRI, to study the neural system associated with the sex drive, romantic love, attachment, rejection, love addiction, and long-term partnership happiness. She has written six books on lust, romance, and attachment, now sold in 25 countries, among them, Why We Love, Why Him, Why Hair, and The Anatomy of Love. She also studied courtship trends in the digital age using a representative sample of 50,000 single Americans to examine hooking up friends with benefits, video chatting, and why today's dating patterns may lead to decades of relative family stability due to a trend she calls slow love. Using data collected from her biological-based questionnaire, the Fisher Temperament Inventory, now taken by 15 plus million people in 40 countries. These numbers are amazing. That's why she's like one of the, I think she's like 0.0. 0.0000001% of the most incredible women who have studied love in the history of our century, I guess. Dr. Fisher is also studying the biological basis of personality and is pioneer examining the neurochemistry of team building, innovation, and leadership. Explain how people of different biological styles of thinking are predisposed to work by, innovate, and lead. Well, this woman is going to blow your mind, and her information is just gold. So I'm sure you're going to be very, very happy you've listened to this episode because it is a gem. And now, without further ado, on to the show. Two, one, zero, four, Hi, Dr. Helen, and thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. Welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. Yay. Before we begin, can you share a little bit about your life story and how you developed that passion to what you are doing today? Well, I talk about love. I, uh, that's what I'm well known for. And as you know, I've put over 100 people into a brain scanner and studied everything about love. And people often assume that it's, I do it because of some tragic love affair of my own. (laughs) Well, I mean, nobody gets out of love alive. We all have our little tragedies. But the bottom line is the reason I really got into this stems from the fact that I'm an identical twin. And as I was growing up, everybody asks identical twins, do you like the same food? Do you have the same friends? Do you think alike, et cetera, et cetera. So long before I knew there was an issue of the nature nurture controversy, how much of our behavior is learned and how much of it comes out of our biology. Long before I learned about that argument, I knew that there was biology to my behavior because as a twin, people are constantly asking you that. So bottom line is when it came time in my PhD I had to write, of course, a PhD dissertation. When I was in graduate school, people believed that everything was learned. Nothing came out of your biology at all. 
we were just a blank slate on which in the environment inscribed personality. And I knew that wasn't true. So I thought to myself, okay, if there's any part of human behavior at all that comes out, out of our biology, it would be the way we love, the way we form partnerships. Because, you know, as Darwin would have said, if you have four children and I have no children, you live on and I die out. So the bottom line is courtship, romance, attachment, marriage is essential to survival. And I thought to myself, okay, if there's any part of human behavior that would have been sort of encoded in some way in our DNA, it would be our what we call reproductive strategy, our strategies for having babies. So that's what got, really got me into studying love. And my PhD dissertation really was on why we marry, why we form pair bonds. I mean, 97% of mammals do not pair up to rear their young. People do. It's a, it's a hallmark of the human creature. And it makes us very unusual in among mammals. And so that's where I started. And that one thing led to another. Nice. What was uh, your most surprising finding in the beginning of your career? Ah, in the beginning of my career, well, that romantic love was a drive. I always thought that it was an emotion or a whole series of emotion from high to low. And it is. There's an awful lot of emotions involved. But when we looked into the brain, when we put people in these brain scanners, we found that the activity in the brain is way at the base of the brain, way below the cortex where you do your thinking, way below limbic regions in the middle of the head that orchestrate the emotions. It's a basic brain region that actually pumps out dopamine, gives you that elation, the giddiness, euphoria. But that brain region lies in the bottom of the brain where all the drives are located. For example, it lies right next to the factory that orchestrates thirst and hunger. Thirst and hunger keep you alive today. Uh, Romantic love drives you to form a partnership, fall in love, form a partnership, and send your DNA into tomorrow. So we now call it a survival mechanism, something that evolved millions of years ago to drive us to form a partnership and send our DNA into tomorrow. So the fact that it was a drive, (laughs) Mm. pretty obvious now that I think about it, but at the time I hadn't. Right, it's very primal to love. Yes, it's very primal. Well said, kid, well said. (laughs) I like that you call me a kid. (laughs) (laughs) So how does that drive the brain chemistry, how does that affect our choices? Oh, well, everybody loves. I've had other colleagues who've looked in over 200 societies and everywhere in the world, people feel the feeling of romantic love. But who we choose is a different issue. And that varies tremendously. But, you know, there's all kinds of reasons that you fall in love with one person rather than another. I mean, all kinds of cultural reasons. I mean, we tend to fall in love with somebody from the same socioeconomic and ethnic background, same general level of intelligence and good looks and education somebody with your same religious and social values, somebody with your economic and reproductive goals. Uh, Your childhood always plays a role. I mean, if your father had a wonderful sense of humor and your mother was really interested in math, uh, you're going to be more likely to choose somebody with those interests. But you can walk into a room and everybody is from your background and the same general level of intelligence and good looks, and you don't fall in love with all of them. So, I began to think, well, maybe basic biology plays a role. And so I began to look through all of the biological literature for any trait at all linked with any biological system. I mean, there's all kinds of systems in the brain that keep the eyes blinking, (laughs) the heart beating, but they're not linked with personality traits. So anyway, after a couple of years of looking around, I was able to find that there are four brain systems that each one of them is linked with a constellation of personality traits, the dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen systems in the brain. So I created a questionnaire to see to what degree You express the traits in each one of these four basic brain systems. Now, 15 million people have now taken that questionnaire in 40 countries. So impressive. Yes, I was lucky because I was working with Match.com, the internet dating site. So they put it on their site. So I was able to watch who's drawn to whom. And as it turns out, 
I call them explorers. These are people who are very high in the dopamine system. And explorers gravitate to other explorers. They are novelty-seeking, risk-taking, curious, creative, spontaneous, energetic people. And they're drawn to people like themselves. High serotonin people, I call these people builders. Uh, They're also drawn to people like themselves. They're traditional, conventional, follow the rules, respect authority, tend to be religious, tend to be concrete thinkers. They're drawn to people like themselves. A good example in America, I think, is Mitt Romney or Mike Pence. And uh, people who are very high on the testosterone scale, I call them directors. They're very drawn to their opposite, high estrogen people who I call negotiators. So high testosterone people, and there's women in that category too. I think Hillary Clinton is one of them. But uh, anyway, they're analytical, logical, direct, decisive tough-minded, tend to be skeptical, good at things like math, engineering, computers, mechanics, and they're drawn to their opposite, the high high estrogen negotiator, people who are see far down the road. uh, They're what I call web thinkers. They're contextual, synthetic, holistic, long-term thinkers. They're imaginative. They've got good people skills, verbal skills. They're good at reading posture, gesture, tone of voice, et cetera. So I was able to watch who we're naturally drawn to. Now, what's important about this is in my questionnaire, the bottom line is we all express all four of these brain systems. The issue is to what degree. Now, for example, I'm very high on the dopamine system. I write books and I make speeches and that that requires, well, certainly curiosity, but some creativity and I deal a lot with the public. So that's some people skills, et cetera. So I'm a low on the testosterone scale. I can barely add. And I have very little of the serotonin traits. I'm not traditional. I don't tend to follow the rules unless they make sense to me, et cetera, et cetera. My new husband and I got married last year. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. (laughs) Oh, thank you. And I'm in my 70s. But anyway, bottom line is he's very high on dopamine, like me. He wrote in the New York Times for 22 years. Now he writes books. He and I were both high on dopamine, which works very well. He's high on testosterone and I'm high on estrogen, which also works very well. So the bottom line is it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight or trans or whether you're 11 years old or 80 years old. These are basic brain systems, and we tend to be drawn to certain people, not only for cultural reasons, but, but because of chemistry. And, you know, people will say, well, we have chemistry. Well, I've been able to begin to figure that out. Mm. Do we have the same chemistry throughout our life, or do, does the chemistry in our brain changes, and therefore we tend to choose different partners down the road? It's a wonderful question. I mean, we all have certain experiences Now, for example, let's say you're a very high dopamine person and you choose a guy who's very charismatic and humorous and good looking and everything, but he's also drinks too much and is adulterous. Well, after you figure that one out and you leave the situation, you're still going to be a high dopamine person, but you're going to remember that experience and choose somebody who is also high dopamine but they're high dopamine in a different way. They are great artists. They're very humorous as well, but uh, they're not a drinker and they're not a cheater. So the bottom line is, sure, we change to some degree, but not a great deal. Now, for example, if you're very high dopamine and you're four years old, you're going to be very curious about dolls or trucks and trains and et cetera. When you are 15, you're going to be curious about boys or girls or whatever. When you're 45, you're going to be curious about travel and or books or architecture or movies or the opera, et cetera. So the fact that you are curious and creative remains the same. What you're curious about is going to change with your life experiences. So we do change to some degree. I mean, now, for example, me, when I was in graduate school, thinking back on this, there was one summer I was living in Colorado I literally went to the bus station, almost with the clothes on my back, and got on a bus and went from from Denver, Colorado, 36 hours to San Francisco, didn't know a single person in San Francisco, got off the bus with, I think, about $36 in my pocket, was able to get it. Wait, what, what's your type? Well, I'm very high dopamine. I'm an explorer. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm very high estrogen. I'm a negotiator, both of those. Okay, so you can be both. 
oh, you can be all of the above. The amount is to what degree. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So anyway, I get to California. I find myself a job and a, an apartment and, and I, I wouldn't do that today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, 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 I would not. So my curiosity, uh, I, Today, instead, well, I've gone to 110 countries. I've traveled around the world, but uh, many times. But today, I'm really interested in the opera, and actually, I'm writing my next book about leadership. So I'm very curious about that. But would I get on a bus the way I was when I was 22, with 36 dollars in my pocket, and go to a foreign, another city? No. <laughs> my curiosity now goes a different direction. But we can change to some extent. You know, we can. Now, for example, we learn to change. I mean, as small children, mother will say, smile for grandma. And you learn to smile. You learn to adapt. You learn to stretch your personality. But it's tiring. I know. I mean, I remember this one woman who said to me, she said, well, you know, during the day, I'm a big deal CEO for a major company. And at night, my husband wants me to be a frilly, fluffy, you know, make the dinner, <laughs> clean up and uh, serve the potato chips on Sports Sunday. And I said, well, how'd, how'd that work? <laughs> and she said, well, I did it. But it was very tiring. And finally, after 15 years of marriage, I left him. So bottom line is we do better when we marry a person who lets us be who we really are. And when we find a job and friends who enable us to be who we really are, we can stretch, we can act out of character, but it's tiring. Wow. So I, I didn't take your question here. I don't know what is my type, but I have a similar life story where when I was uh, in my early, very early 20s, I only had $700 and I did my first international travel. I went to Japan and $700 in those days in Tokyo were good for like two days, three days. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, right. Did you go alone? I went by myself. Yeah. Good for you. Wow. Well, tell me how did it work <laughs> out. And Japan is not going to San Francisco. I mean, they didn't speak your language. Very different culture. It was very odd to land in Narita. I was, it was a, a sea of people that are, you know, in Israel, we, back in the days, we didn't have as many Asian people. So just to see a whole airport full of Asian people, most of them are shorter than me. It was an interesting experience. Shocking, wonderful. I, I found a job and ended up finding a job and finding a, I fell in love with a Japanese guy and he was just an extraordinary man. And I ended up staying there for three and a half years. And Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. And then I traveled the world. I traveled over 40 countries and did lots of exploring, but I, did, I was like, oh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> did you uh, learn Japanese? I did. I did. Good for you. That was the only way for me to stay there because I, I had to learn Japanese. Oh, yeah. Okay. And back to you and your extraordinary expertise. When you look at those types, can you break down the pros and cons of each type? Yeah. You know, the very high dopamine type of person, as I say, I call them explorers. As I say, they're novelty seeking, risk taking, curious, creative, spontaneous energetic people. They can also be very unpredictable, somewhat insincere, overly generous so that they throw their money around. There's not been any studies of this, but my guess is, it's I mean, just an educated guess, that they're going to be more inclined to various kinds of addictions mm. because all of the addictions in some way or another uh, affect the dopamine system in the brain. So that would be my educated hypothesis. People who are very high on the serotonin scale, builders, traditional, conventional, follow the rules, respect authority, concrete rather than theoretical thinkers, uh, tend to be more religious. On the downside, they can be moralistic, uh, inflexible. Judgmental. Judgmental. And they may be, this is, now this is really a guess, they may be more inclined to obsessive compulsive disorder. This all needs to be studied more. I mean, I, I've now stumbled on how the brain works. I, I feel as if I've sort of snuck into Mother Nature's kitchen <laughs> and figured out some of her basic recipes for 
human thinking and behavior. I think they can stay. I think that the high dopamine explorers might be romance junkies. They may be the kind that flip from one person to another because they like, they like that initial high. Whereas it is my guess that the high serotonin builders, I call them, as I said, are going to be more likely to stay in a relationship too long. They may be attachment junkies because it's a sense of honor for them. They said they were going to do this. They're going to be stubborn about doing this. And they may end up staying in a relationship far too long because they don't want to be judged. And they made a promise and they're going to keep it even if there's spousal abuse. The high testosterone may be violence junkies and may be more on the autism spectrum too. But anyway, these people, as I said, they analytical, logical, direct, decisive, tough-minded, and maybe more on the narcissists too. Not all of them, of course. You know, there's some very well-adjusted people in all of these categories. But if there are some predispositions, I would think that the high testosterone type is going to be more inclined to violence and more predisposed to maybe narcissism and on the autism spectrum. And on the last group, the estrogen negotiators. Yeah, they may be more of the sort of the codependents sticking something, not because it's the right thing to do, but because they need to understand it. These people, as I mentioned, are verbal skills, people skills, good at reading posture, gesture, tone of voice, see the big picture, holistic, synthetic thinkers, empathetic. And that empathy may get itself overdone. They may get to feeling that they want to work it out. They, they may be more susceptible to sticking with something, as I said, not because they promise to do it, but because they want to understand, they want to work through it, et cetera. And I do think that they are seem to be more inclined to clinical depression, or at least some of the characteristics of clinical depression. And perhaps also they can be placators. They don't say anything to keep peace. And there's times when one really should bark back <laughs> and say, you know, that doesn't work. They have a very good memory. Uh, there's a lot of estrogen receptors in the hippocampus, the basic memory factory. And they can remember something you didn't do five years ago, something you said that was hurtful 10 years ago. They can nurse a grudge. <laughs> and that might be the downside of them. But there's upsides to all of these, of course. Right. It's not absolute. Like we all have different percentages of, of each type. And, and like you said, we can all like just the fact that you have high dopamine or high testosterone doesn't mean that you have the pros or the cons of that trait. Right. It means that you, have, you probably have some a lot of the pros because that's what my questionnaire studies. By the way, you can get that questionnaire in, well, certainly my most recent book, Anatomy of Love, second edition, but also in the book, Why We Love. And it's all over the internet. You can go to my website, HelenFisher.com. So it's available and it's just paper and pencil. And you can do it uh, very easily. Actually, I've got a newer version of it, a second uh, version of it, which is even better. I really like it. But it costs quite a bit of money now to take that. Say, it's part of a, a company. I started a company uh, with a co-founder called NeuroColor. And actually, we go into businesses and help them understand their clients, help them work together more effectively, etc. And so that's the NeuroColor questionnaire. It's basically the same questionnaire, but I added and perfected some things. So hopefully that will be on the market pretty soon at a very low price. But anyway, you can take my uh, Fisher Temperament Inventory in any of my books or just go to the internet. And that's no money involved and just paper and pencil. And, and there we are. That's very exciting. So I have a two-year-old son. And if I want to recognize his type, if he's high dopamine or high serotonin, high testosterone or high estrogen, how do I recognize that in him without taking the questionnaire? Yeah. Well, first of all, don't forget that he's going to be a combination of all of them. Right. Personality is not very stable in childhood. And it's actually not very stable in old age either because older people have learned to accommodate. It's most stable in middle age when you've got the right partner who lets you be who you are and you've got the right kind of job that, and friends that let you be who you are. So it's not terribly stable and children are, are very susceptible to peer pressure. So they're mm. going to try and fit in with their friends. Nevertheless, I think a lot of these characteristics appear very rapidly. 
how curious is your son? Is he fearful? Or when he goes into a room and there's a lot of new toys, does he rush for them? Does he hold back and cling to your leg? You know, if there's a lot of new people, does he hide behind you or does he go and you shake hands and start smiling? I have a wonderful friend at Match. You know, I've worked with Match for years, Amy Kennedy, and she has a two-year-old son and he goes into the kitchen and opens and shuts the kitchen drawers where the silverware is and wants to know how the drawer works. Now, that's a, gonna, that's a kid who's probably a high testosterone child. Now, I never, when I walked into a room when I was two years old, never wanted to know how the draw worked. <laughs> he wants to know, my son wants to know what everything works. Yet when we're with, with new people, he gets shy, but then he starts flirting with them. <laughs> Flirt, flirting with them. Yeah. yeah the babies are very flirtatious. It's true. <laughs> it's very cute. Is he verbally skilled now at age two? And a half? Extremely, very advanced. In bilingual too. And he's curious. Very curious, yes. Uh-huh. Well, my guess is, I mean, I'm, I don't know. You know, I wouldn't want to really say, but he's probably quite high on the dopamine and the testosterone scale. And we'll figure out about the estrogen scale. It's very interesting. The man that I married is very high on three scales. Very high on dopamine scale. He's been all over the world. He writes, you know, he's a big, well-known writer. But he's also a techie. So he's got some of the verbal skills of the high estrogen, but he's not, he's empathetic with his family, but he's not worldwide empathetic. So he scores lower on the estrogen scale. So I guess your son is sounds like at age two, he's high on, uh, higher on the dopamine and the testosterone. It's very interesting. Now, for example, when my husband's son was around six years old, now this child, now he's a grown guy. Is very high on the serotonin scale. He's traditional. He's conventional. He follows the rules. He's religious. He respects authority. He's detail-oriented, all serotonin. But anyway, they were going to a playground, and it was beginning to get dark. My husband was rushing into the playground, and the six-year-old stopped at the entrance of the playground and said, are you sure, Dad, that we're supposed to be in here after dark? <laughs> nice. Wow. So he was already following the rules and respecting authority. So I do think that once you get to know the traits linked with each one of these brain systems, and the way to really do that is to, to read my book, Why Him, Why Her. I really go through it in that book or any of my academic articles. But the bottom line is, once you get to know the traits linked with each one of these four brain systems, you begin to see it in the child. You begin to see, oh, wow, he's more curious than his little friend who comes over to play. Oh, he, he you know, the toy broke and, and he wants to fix it in the, the other kid wants to step on it, you know. <laughs> and so I think once you get to understand the four styles of thinking and behaving, you begin to see it not only in children, but in everybody else, even dogs and cats. And which one of your books is the one that is specific for those four types? Why him, why her? Why him, why her? Okay, good. But it's also discussed in, in one chapter of my most recent book, Anatomy of Love, second edition. But why him, why her? Yes. And all that's going to be in my next book. I haven't got a title for that book yet. And that's going to be for business as well as, I mean, it was very interesting. You know, it suddenly occurred to me, wow, my work doesn't apply just to love. It applies to any relationship. One of my best friends is very high on the serotonin scale and I'm very high at dopamine and she's detail oriented. Everything has to go to a schedule. She makes plans weeks in advance for this or that. The next thing. And I find when I'm around her that I'm almost acting, that I'm, I'm not comfortable with who I am around her. I, I'm trying to fit into another person's worldview. I like her. She's very smart and very interesting, but I'm not naturally who I am. So after a while, you begin to feel almost once you get to know all this stuff. And then you also begin to hunch, okay, this person is this way, so I should act this way around them. And that's key. I don't believe in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. I believe in the platinum rule, do unto others as they would have done unto them. Beautiful. And, and that leads me to my next question, because if I want to build rapport with one of those types, how do I even recognize them without taking the quiz, just like looking at them? 
if I just meet someone, like I just met someone in a in a I don't networking event, how can I instantly know? Oh, it probably can I have an education guess on they're probably this type, and for this type, I should build rapport this way. Yeah, this is all in my next book, and uh, well, it's easy to make mistakes. Let's put it that way. The more you get to know somebody, the more you can see the various traits. For example, if I'm at a conference and somebody comes up to me and they're very sweet and almost deferential and curl their shoulders and immediately say, well, Dr. Fisher, I, you know, I haven't read your books, but I thought it was very interesting that you did da 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 self-deprecating. I figure they're going to be high estrogen. I figure I can look straight into their face, do what's called the anchoring gaze, smile sweetly and talk more intimately with them, et cetera. If somebody comes up to me and immediately wants to know every single detail and why I hadn't said this, you know, I mean, every single detail and everything, I will assume my first assumption, I could be wrong, but my first assumption is that they're high serotonin builder. These people really like the details. If they come up and immediately challenge me, immediately say, well, I read this other thing about that. And are you positive, you know, at the testosterone? Yeah, that's testosterone. <laughs> and if somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I've got a good idea. You said this and that, and I think that was really right. And go on with their own ideas about it. That's going to be high dopamine, the explorer. So how do you treat the explorers? Especially after you just spoke for an hour and, and people come to you and you need to almost like, it's almost like being a a social ninja, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with, uh, with all those people and all those different responses. How do you handle that? If an explorer comes and say, I know your idea was such and such, and you should think about this and this and that and that. How do you deal with that? How do you handle them? Well, it depends on the person. The one thing I have always done when I'm attacked is keep my temper. Always. There have been times when Suddenly when somebody really insults you and you get a flare up almost as if your ears are pounding, I'm able to just smile and keep my voice in a normal, in a normal state, no matter how I feel. So that's essential just to keep myself together. Mm. But most people don't come up to attack me. Of course not. Yeah. But you always, there is always like one out of a. Well, I try to answer their question. I try to listen to what they got to say. Number one, I learn a lot from what people say. Oddly enough, I often learn much more from the public than I do from other academics because other academics stick to a much narrower view. These people are often thinking way outside the box. They're thinking in ways I never thought of. So I learn a lot from the question. I like the question and answer period in my deliveries because I learned so much. And of course, if I don't know the answer, I say, I don't know the answer. and I'll get back to you or, or nobody knows the answer, whatever. But how do I deal with them? I try to answer their question. And I try to, I don't know how to ask them about themselves. I like to figure out why they ask that question, where they're coming from. Yeah. In one of your lectures that I was listening to, you told a story about being in the in a black tie event and you were surrounded by I think five guys and one <laughs> of them was really high testosterone and he was just not being very kind to you and you assumed the body language of a I guess an estrogen dominated negotiator becoming smaller and then finally you had enough and you just <laughs> you said something that you describe as nasty and your body language changed to match his high testosterone and then he you put him in his place i did and it was a, it was called it's called dominance matching and how charming of you to remember it it's called dominance matching and the high testosterone type will attack and they expect you to attack back if they expect you to attack back and you don't then they don't respect you they think you're weak And so I, just like you said, I, you know, these two basic postural messages, crouch and loom throughout the animal community, all kinds of animals, like a dog, when it's stolen your dinner, it'll slink away with <laughs> tail between its legs because it's, it's in the crouch position. So I got smaller. This guy was really taking me to the cleaners and he was enjoying it. And the other three were watching and I just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, I don't know what happened in my brain snap. And I turned around and what I said 
Iran was not just nasty, it was vicious. I don't remember what it was, but it was vicious. And it was also funny. And they all just, they just, they became really stiff and they barred teeth, you know, clenched teeth, <laughs> drawn lips, the whole deal. And I said to myself, oh, Helen, <laughs> <laughs> if he thinks like a woman, he'll never forgive you. If he thinks like a man and it's dominance matching, he will respect you. So anyway, the bottom line is you're just, you're right in the, you're the way you explained it. You know, all of a sudden he threw up his hands. He said, oh, well, and he started to laugh. That let the others laugh too. And that man has respected me from that day to this. And it's very interesting because it's hard for me to do that. I'll tell you another story that I haven't mentioned in public, I don't think. Anyway, I've got a girlfriend who's very high testosterone. I mean, this girl eats rocks for breakfast. I mean, she's <laughs> big time. And she attacks all the time. I'm crazy about her. She's very interesting. She's very smart. She's very funny. But uh, there's a lesson here. But anyway, the bottom line is I walked in to have lunch with her one day. And she said to me, said, I, hey, Helen, where did you get that purse? I said, well, I bought it in the street. And she said, it looks like it. It's cheap. And I said, Mary... That's rude. And Jerry, I just let it slide. But this time I sort of had enough. I said, Mary, that is so rude. And she said, Helen, I'm just being honest. I'm trying to help you. So the bottom line is these people who are attacking, sometimes they think that this is good. Now, what's interesting about that lunch is she forgot it instantly. And she bounced off back to her business and but I suffered from it. For about three days, I said to myself, Helen, why did you attack back? Why did you lose your composure? So it's not comfortable for the high estrogen to attack unless they're really mad. High estrogen will certainly protect their children and their ideas. But uh, the bottom line is we can act out of character, but it's tiring and it can be uncomfortable. And then did you shop at Chanel? <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh -huh. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so I want to get a step forward beyond building a rapport. How can we influence those four types? Not quite sure what you mean by... Well, if, if, if I'm as a coach, I have uh, somebody I coach and I, and I notice him or her, they're, they're this one personality type. How could I talk to them in a way that will influence change in them? How, I guess, build a, even a deeper rapport with them to make them shift the behavior or accept an idea that can help them. Okay. Once again, I write about all this in my next book, so I'm really glad that you're interested in it. There's a lot of things to do, but let's just pick them, a couple of them. For the high testosterone type, these people get to the point. They get right to the point and they don't suffer fools gladly. So with that kind of person, I get right to the point too. You can be very honest, very brash, very direct, very blunt. You can tell them exactly how it is and how you feel about it. If you are too nuanced, they won't get it. They're not going to read your posture, just your tone of voice very easily. If you're annoyed, you've got to tell them that you're annoyed. If you're happy with what they said, you have to tell them. You've got to be very clear. And they can stand your bluntness, your honesty. And the other thing I do with high testosterone is I don't look them in the eye. For millions of years, men face their enemies. They sat side by side with friends. So with a man, particularly if I'm angry, I will stand really at an angle or I'll sit side by side and look straight ahead as I get angry. One of the problems that people do, mothers do with high testosterone on little boys is they go straight at them with their fists, you know, clenched and look straight in the eye. And the kid is so overwhelmed that they're really probably not even listening to what the parent says. So with high testosterone, I don't do the anchoring gaze. I look away. I get to the point. I am blunt, honest. I say what I mean. I tell them how I feel because they're not going to figure that out. With the high estrogen, you can go way around the bend with them. I mean, you can really talk about feelings. You can really engage their feelings. You can ask them more and more about how they felt during this situation, why they felt that way. Explore feelings with them. These people are often ruminators. They think over and over and over about something. Ask about the rumination. Find out 
what they are, you know, like a, a mouse on a treadmill, thinking about over and over and over and discuss that with them, point out that they're doing all that ruminating, that they're really raising the ghost. Try and find a way for them to get off that path. And I mean, sometimes with me, I'll just say, stop it, Helen. Stop thinking about that. Pick another topic because all you're doing is creating more anxiety for yourself. With the high serotonin, the builder, I emphasize tradition. I go with the details. I often talk about what's right. I respect their need for closure. These people need closure. So let's say you're with the person and you don't get to saying or addressing a certain issue. Don't let it hang. Don't let it hang until next time. Say very clearly, we never got to talking about that incident with your mother. We'll start with that next time at 9 a.m. on Thursday. Give them the schedule. Give them the plan. When they walk into the room, say, or just on the phone, whatever you're doing with them, today we're going to talk about these three things. Does that work for you? What three things do you plan it out? They might. They need process. They need schedules. They need procedures. And with the high dopamine, these people are often very charismatic and very charming, but they don't look in. They look out. They're not good at self-reflection. So you might try to generate, you might even say to them, oh, wow, you know, you're the very charming, charismatic type. That type apparently doesn't really like to look in instead of out. So let's do a little practice session about thinking about yourself a little bit more and how you might have felt. So I guess what I would do, I mean, I know this is a little self-serving, but if you gave them my book (laughs) or at least gave them a questionnaire and explained to them a little bit more of who they are, it might help them understand why they see the world the way they do. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. I want to be respectful of your time. So before we say goodbye for now, two questions. What are your three quick tips to live in a stellar life and where can people find you? Three tips for a stellar life. (laughs) Marry the right person. (laughs) Get the right job. All the basics for God's sakes. Move. Keep moving. Get some exercise every day. Learn something new every day. Smile. Smiling is very good for you. The most important thing is to get a positive partnership. Hugs drive up oxytocin, gives you calm and feelings of attachment. Laughter drives up the dopamine system, gives you energy, optimism, focus, motivation. Play with that person, brings along brain growth, emotional processing, decision-making, uh, reduces pain. Bottom line is positive relationships are important. Get rid of the caustic people in your life and focus on the positive ones. We'll go with that. And in terms of where to find me, I just finished my new website, helenfisher.com or any of my books. And you're, you're all over YouTube and you have an amazing, I think two amazing TED Talks. So yeah, people can find you there and your information is going to be in the show notes as well on StellaLifePodcast.com. Dr. Helen Fisher, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Orion. And thank you, listeners. Remember to marry the right person, move, smile, hug, love, laugh, and have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time. Thank you for joining me on my mission to light people up and change lives around the world. I hope today's conversation inspires you to step up, go after the life of your dreams, and be who you want to be. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go to StellarLifePodcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and other cool stuff. And please subscribe, review, and help spread the word by sharing us on Facebook and Twitter. Have a lovely day, and I'll catch you on the next episode.